after we've talked about those civil wars, I think it is probably appropriate to say the British aren't entirely stupid, okay? They know they have a problem in North America at this point because you've had these two rebellions and something's not wor right working. And by the way, the Francophones are still not assimilating and we're not really sure what's happening there. So they decide to send someone to go investigate and figure out what is going on here, okay? Um, and they decide to send a man named Lord Durham, who is a member of the House of Lords, uh, and he was Governor General, Governor General of British North America, i.e. what is now Canada, uh, for about four months in 1838. And he resigns after he has a fight with London, and that's a fight that we don't really have to get into. His job is to go investigate the causes of those rebellions. He's, he's sent out into Canada and he decides to sort of figure out what's going on here, okay? And I'm gonna say a couple of things about what those investigations look like because this is quite different than what we would sort of see now um, in a sort of context. Because if we were going to do an investigation into like the causes of this kind of rebellion today, you would wind up with a national commission, you would wind up with a bunch of people who flew across, like you'd wind up with commissioners who flew across the country. We will talk a little bit about what some of these commissions look like when we get to the Royal Commission on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, when we get to the, Royal, to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Those are coming a little bit later on. But what you'd have is people flying across the country and talking to people all across the country and hosting town halls and having written submissions and talking to NGOs and trying to get a sort of pretty broad perspective about what's going on. That is not what happens in 1938 when Lord Durham starts his investigations. Some of that is a simple technological piece, right? Um, in 1838, large portions of Canada are not easily navigable in the winter in that the only way you can really get around quickly is to do it by water. And that means you have to do it in throughout the spring and into the fall, okay? Because if you do it any later than that, you can get stuck um, and you can't, like you can destroy ships. It's just not a workable situation, okay? So some of that is a technological piece. So if we wanted to do the kind of consultation that we would do in a contemporary context, it would take a lot longer um, in 1838 to do it. But part of that is also that we didn't really have, at a policy level, that kind of bureaucratic structure. So basically, Lord Durham decides to like go on a four-month tour of Canada and visit his friends and have parties for a while. Um, and this is very standard. This is what lords and aristocrats did. They sort of talked to other lords and aristocrats and elites when they were trying to figure something out. So Lord Durham's trip through Upper and Lower Canada basically means he's visiting people he likes already. And if you think about who you are likely to be friends with if you are a British sort of aristocrat in the 1830s who was the Governor General of Canada, you're friends with the Anglophones who live in Lower Canada, so the English-speaking population of what is now Quebec, and the moderates, right? Like you cannot associate with the radicals in Upper Canada, so you're friends with the moderates, the people who are like, yes, maybe we need some changes, but generally speaking, the British crown is lovely and we like our system, okay? So he spent a couple of months doing that. He didn't really talk to, you know, anyone who spoke French. He didn't really talk to Catholics. He didn't really talk to anyone who wasn't wealthy enough to be an appropriate host for an English lord. So understand that his investigations are perhaps not as thorough as they might likely have liked to have been. Um, that said, he does come out of his investigations with a, with a really famous statement that I will share and then we'll sort of talk about what his report finds. Okay? So the first thing that comes out of this is this really, really, really famous statement that we will sort of talk about and you'll sort of hear if you read in any amount of Canadian history, you've probably heard it before. Lord Durham is responsible for describing Canada um, as being a problem because there are two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. Um, and for those of you who don't speak aristocratic English from the 1830s, what that basically means is you have two groups of people with very different ideas and very different sort of goals and dreams trying to share a single government. And if that sounds like approximately the problem Canada has had since the 1660s, you're right. Um, and we're still dealing with a lot of that sort of tension, although I will say that now we're probably dealing with a much larger number than two. Um, 
So that's Lord Durham's investigation. And again, right, remember, Lord Durham is a British aristocrat. So he didn't talk to the indigenous population at all. So there's no conversation in this about, hey, by the way, treaties are a problem, we should deal with that. Um, he's talking about exclusively um, this sort of tension between Anglophones and Francophones. He doesn't submit his report until 1840. Um, and we will go through a little bit what he has recommended um, in this process. And he doesn't he writes some pretty good recommendations that the British Crown largely ignores, okay? So he recommends essentially three things, okay? That, or rather, he recommends three things that the government doesn't do. He recommends the creation of official municipal governments, which the British government is like, yeah, okay, we can do that. So they create municipal governments for Toronto and Montreal and Quebec City, and they kind of do that. But the three main things that Durham recommends that we do in order to fix these tensions in Upper Canada, in, in, in sort of British North America, um, is to unify Upper and Lower Canada, to create, to, to turn them back into, sing, into a single colony so that there's some interaction. And Lord Durham is a British aristocrat, so his goal there is to assimilate the Francophones. He'll sort of say, like, if we create one, colony, then the Francophone population will be exposed to superior British norms, cultures, and all of that, and eventually they'll just go, oh, that's a much better way of doing it, and they'll become Anglophone, okay? And in some ways, that's an attempt to fix that institutionalization of Anglophone and Francophone tensions that were created in Canada with the Constitution Act of 1791. And they kind of don't do that at all, like, like at all. So the province of Canada is created in 1841. There's a single province of Canada. Awesome. With two separate but equal assemblies, one for Upper Canada and one for Lower Canada. Essentially exactly what we had in 1791 rather than what Durham recommended was to sort of unify those two states, okay? That's a problem. Um, and in many ways, that's something that we're still dealing with today, and we can sort of talk about that in a lot of different ways. Um, another major recommendation he has is to actually create a Canadian Supreme Court. So we will talk about this a little bit as we sort of go forward. It's really important for things like women's right to vote and to serve in the Senate in Canada. Um, but Canada doesn't have its own Supreme Court until 1875 although that was allowed by the Treaty of Paris in 1763, it was just never done. No one created a Canadian Supreme Court. Um, so if you had a problem with a ruling that was created in Canada, you had to essentially take it to the British Privy Council. Like you had to take it all the way across the ocean and that meant that only a certain number of people could do it. So in 1875, they do create, so 35 years after he submits this report about, hey, we should have this thing that we should have done 100 years ago, um, we should do that thing. It is created 35 years after the fact. Um, and the other th the thing that you need to understand about that is that this is actually not the final court of appeal in Canada until 1949. So almost 75 years after that. Um, this is really important because if you sort of look at the person's case, and we can talk about the famous five and all that sort of stuff, um, the person's case is actually decided not in Canada at all. Can the Canadian Supreme Court said women were not people, um, but they took but the famous five, so Louise McKinney and Agnes MacPhail and Nellie McClung and all of those people, took their case to the British Privy Council, and they're the ones who decided that, because the British Crown didn't really establish that Canadian laws needed to be decided in Canada until the mid 19 until late 1940s. Okay, so there's that sort of delay. Um, and the other thing that Durham recommended would probably be a good idea in order to fix this problem and sort of avoid the challenges of the 1837 and 1838 rebellions is to give the Canadian government, the Canadian colonies responsible government, right, um, to sort of have taxes levied, um, by the people who decided how that money was spent. And this does happen faster than at least the Supreme Court thing, but it has nothing to do with the British Crown deciding that this is a good idea. Okay, 
So when we start talking about colonies, one of the things that you need to understand is that really early on, the understanding was, and we'll talk about taxes in our next unit, but the understanding was that the colonizing country, so in this case Britain, was essentially responsible for all of the expenses in the colonial area, era. So that means that the roads have to be paid for by Britain, the shipyards have to be paid for by Britain, infrastructure, regulatory, salaries, all of that stuff is supposed to be paid for by Britain because the colony is sort of like a vassal state and it doesn't really do anything, right? If you think about Britain in 1847, you recognize that Britain has a lot of colonies in the sense that the phrase that was quite common at the time is the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, which is a description of saying that the British Empire had so many colonies spread so far around the world that it was always daytime somewhere uh, in British controlled country territory. And one of the things that that means is if you have all of Canada, all of India, large portions of Africa, large portions of Asia, it gets really expensive when the only thing that's paying the bills is this teeny tiny island nation. And so in 1847, responsible government is created, again, not because the British government was like, that's a great idea, but because they went, holy crap, colonies are expensive. If we let them make some of their own decisions, we can make them pay for it on their own. Um, and that's sort of a big change that sort of happens in that sort of 1847 piece. And those are largely the results of Lord Durham's report, right? Um, and that's sort of the sort of fallout of the 1837 and 1838 rebellions, all right?